as we do get started. And actually, the first thing we're going to do tonight on this, just so we get to know you in the audience a little bit better, is we're going to do a poll question. And the poll question is, have you ever landed out in a glider? I'm going to go ahead and launch this poll question. And it is open, so I'm going to ask for everyone, if you would, please vote. And, you know, there is an added answer that you see from what you may have seen on the screen uh, to begin with. It is there for the airplane pilots. And an interesting side note to this whole story is, had I landed off airport in airplanes before? Yes, yes, I had. But it, even though I had been flying gliders for a while, it took a while for me to end up doing what's being called land out in a glider. So we're about 40 seconds in. We got about 87% of you, which is we're passing 360 people online right now, uh, which is terrific. As I said, we had about 750 pre-registered. We'll let it go, 88%. Boy, the polls would love that. We, we very well could see that in the next election. All right, there we go. I'm gonna close this, and John, we've done this a bit before. I'm gonna share the results, but because you really have a much better view of it than I do, I'm gonna ask you to go through what the results were. All right, live, John? Thank you, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Yeah, it's the winter. It's the winter. It's getting to me. <laughs> um, yeah, anyway, <laughs> yeah, I was, I was talking very happily to my computer right then, um, but nobody was hearing me because I was on mute. Thank you. Um, so yes is 15%. No is 48%. More than I can recall is 2%. I never plan to is 1%, and I don't fly gliders is 35%. So we have a, a lot of uh, powered plane pilots with us tonight. Oh, well, that's good. That is good. And you definitely will learn a few things and a few things to think about for the power plant. And, you know, I pretty much, I would almost say I was in the 1%. I never really did um, plan to land out before at all. And I even planned on being in that no category at some point in time. But, you know, I should have known better is how the story starts here is I really, I, oh no, I said it. I thought to myself, I'm doomed now. That's it. I jinxed myself. It's going to happen for sure. It actually is about three weeks prior to the date of this event. And I'm out being an FAA person at a training course in Oklahoma City with about another 10 FAA inspectors. Somehow the subject of emergency, precautionary, and off-air port landings came up. And most of them know that I fly gliders for fun and also within the FAA, which none of them do, except for one of the inspectors got his rating 30 years ago, but has not flown gliders since. But a few of them have had to deal with gliders that have landed out, so they want to know about a good way to handle it. Being airplane types mostly, from urban areas, they think it's a real emergency when a glider lands out, you know, and it deserves a lot of attention and scrutiny. I even think I hear the classic statement is, well, but you can't do that. No, no, that's against the rules. So <laughs> we end up sitting down and talking about it. You know, it's off on the side. We talked about the rules and the regulations, legal interpretations, and even one of the things that we talk about a lot in our office and nearby offices with off airport landings is um, FAR 157. You know, it ends up, I am a guy from Alaska, end up talking about ski and backcountry flying to help the others understand a little bit of what it's like landing at someplace other than, you know, a defined airport. Then the question comes up, and I knew it was going to. How many times have you landed out? And, you know, I thought about it. I don't ever remember. I've landed in many fields and lakes and stuff on skis and even on wheels, but in a glider, never. And really, where I normally fly in gliders, there's not many fields. Just a lot of thick trees, granite, and not so nice places for gliders, especially in the winter. 
And, you know, you pretty much always want to operate that you make it back to the airport. So we sit down and then I'm sitting there and I'm like, oh, no, I said it. I did. It's going to happen now. I, I'm doomed. <laughs> you know, I jinxed myself. Little did I really know that it would be the very next time, just a few weeks later, that I go and fly a glider. And this is what ended up happening just a few weeks after that conversation. Now, as I really start to get into the story, I'm going to cover a couple items. And if you do know me as a person and as a fast team program manager, and I think this is the case for all of us, a lot of our safety reps, all of our safety reps that are out there. You know, really what we try to do is be an ombudsman for the general aviation pilot to help the typical general aviation pilot understand how and why the FA does what it does and why they approach things certain ways because they're tasked with ensuring the safety of the public. But I also know and understand that for various reasons, not all the people in the FAA get to see what general aviation is like all of the time. So I do my best to stay involved in general aviation while also working for the FAA. And as a result, I, I describe my position quite often as being an ombudsman for the general aviation pilot. And with that tonight, what I'm gonna tell you a little bit is the story what happened and how it happened, why it happened, what I learned. I actually, I very purposely sat down and talked to a few mentor pilots of mine about this event um, for a while, actually. It really turned into a couple months, longer than I thought. And a few started saying, you, you ought to talk about this in work, Steve, you know, not just keep it hidden. So we did it as a uh, seminar over the summer as a trial. And then we said, you know, this would make a good webinar too. And that's why we're here tonight. But what is it that I learned, what you can learn and how you and I both can be safer. We don't want this to take long, but it is a little bit longer than probably our normal. It's gonna be closer to 90 minutes tonight. And to start with, I'll just talk about, you know, what we are looking at from the FAA. Um, you know, a glider landing out, hey, it does happen. It happens in competitions. Gliders don't typically have that extra out of the engine of an airplane, um, you know, but it can happen with geography, with season, with weather. They all have such an impact on your level of success. And, you know, I even find it funny. I know this picture, if I recall correctly, was taken down in Texas. Uh, well-known glider pilot and glider, you might tell by the number um, on the trailer in relation to it, but I fly down in Texas quite often in gliders and airplanes. And, you know, they always, oh, let's do a simulated engine out. Or, you know, if we looked at, if we had a circumstance where we might end up landing out in a glider, where are you gonna land? And jokingly, but there is some truth to it in my eyes being from, northern New England is I'll just close my eyes and flare when we get close to the ground because it seems you can almost land anywhere. But that's not always the case. And just a simple land out like this, we in the FAA, we would typically call that an occurrence. That when anything happens, we call it an event to start with. And then the next level up is an occurrence where it may, and I emphasize here, may have an impact on aviation safety. Doesn't mean that it does, but that it could have for various reasons. The next level up, usually if there is some damage associated with the aircraft and like glider landing out where it could be a little bit more tricky as it was for this gentleman, is we would call it an incident. An incident does have an impact on safety. Uh, you know, it may end up being just the decision making, it may end up being the certification of the aircraft, it may end up um, being damage that's done to the aircraft that requires some repair, but it's minor. You know, those we qualify as an incident. And then the more tragic ones, uh, you know, and this is the case for airplanes and gliders, but an accident like this poor gentleman in uh, Great Britain, 
if I recall correctly, you know, that ended up landing out in the top of trees. Now, if you do fly in areas of trees uh, in different types, carnivorous and deciduous, you'll notice here, you see the benefits of landing out in deciduous trees because the branches tend to go up and tend to soften the impact and kind of catch the glider. Whereas in carnivorous trees, the branches tend to go down and usually will not uh, keep the glider from going all the way to the ground, will not slow it down significantly, and the aircraft may hit the ground fairly hard. And, you know, sometimes it can be downright scary, you know. But the positive thing with this is no matter any of these events, whether occurrence, incident, or accident, you know, in all of these, the pilot basically walked away with hardly a scratch on, in all three of these events. On the regulatory side, as I mentioned, we use a few major pieces of terminology. An accident, which is defined by the NTSB and NTSB Part 830. The NTSB also has a category called serious incident, and those, like accidents, are immediately reportable. You may remember those as the additional items that you saw on your knowledge test about the greater than $25,000 of damage to property, loss of uh, more than uh, two engines in flight, you know, so forth and so on, inability of a crew member to perform their duties. That is a separate category that only the NTSB has, and those are called serious incidents and also do require immediate notification. Accidents require immediate notification. Serious incidents require immediate notification. Incidents, occurrences, and events don't necessarily require notification. And for Part 91, really don't. In the FAA, we end up finding out about it at yeah, incidents, occurrences, or events by happenstance, either we end up being there, you know, someone tells us about it, an airport manager tells us about it, a state aviation authority tells us about it, air traffic control tells us about it. You know, at towered airports, air traffic controllers are required to report, for lack of a better way to put it, anomalies. And within the FAA for landing out at least our FISDO and what many FISDOs will use as a starting guideline is the definitions and the criteria you'll see in FAR 157.1. You know, and the next thing you'll hear from the FAA is the classic, it depends because of the gray area is 9113. You know, if nothing happens, it's usually all fine and dandy. It's when something does happen on the bad side that, you know, the FAA tends to look at a little bit more. The state may have a different definition associated with this uh, for the glider pilot world. I know some states that in off airport landing, they could care less about. In other states, they want you to file an accident or an incident report anytime that a glider were to land off airport. So you got to worry about that. And then also there's other government agencies, you know. <laughs> uh, we probably have seen in Soaring Society of America and other forums, you know, stories about glider pilot thermaling over a nuclear plant and how maybe some um, government agencies or authorities were not so happy about that in the past. Uh, you know, a lot of those, it, it all depends <laughs> with it. And if you go on the Soaring Society of America, you can find this legal interpretation, but basically where it says the FAA doesn't consider an off airport landing by a sailplane or glider as a reportable incident if there's no damage to the aircraft property of another or injury to any person. You know, in reality, we, we don't care that much. You know, go out, have fun. And we even get to it some. If you take a look at the FAA glider flying handbook, this is the ASA reprint cover uh, being shown here. But, you know, on the regulatory side, we don't look at it much. It, it is a bit of a gray area, but it really is in favor of the pilot. 
So there's a little bit of background um, in relation to what we'll be taking a look at today. And let me finish off with a little bit more of the story and what happened. So I'll tell you a little bit about the day. It was a day forecast for some light mountain wave, basically above about 5,000 feet, really with no thermal activity because it was early January in Vermont. You know, no ridge lift. The intent was to get out and fly. There's a group of us that we try our best, even though the weather is cold, uh, that we keep our gliders stored where we have access to them and access to a tow plane all year round. And, you know, we try to get out at least one day a month to get out and do some flying. Just to, if not anything, just say that we did, <laughs> you know. And it was a mild day with some wave forecast and very little cloud cover. It was the third, I was the third glider to launch that day. And the previous two had found very weak wave over what we call just north of the castle. But it was requiring a fairly high tow. I was prepared as I normally am for a wave flight up to 18,000 if needed, you know, and the appropriate clothing, equipment, heaters. And although I had never landed out before after I did get my glider, I tried to make sure that I had it prepared, you know, the trailer, the car, everything just in case. Is I didn't want to put any extra burden on other people. Looking at the forecast in the web there, it appeared that there'd be a little bit of a wave street. Uh, as I'll call it, that you can see. This was out of Springfield, Vermont, um, Victor Sierra Foxtrot Airport, which, there we go, is located right up in this area here. And as I was mentioning, most of the area I was flying in, this is off a weather forecast. Um, pilots may know it, you can see just some weak wave forecast in the area. And that's what it was going to do. And it appeared that that wave street would track to the north, just east of Route uh, 100, and along the ridge line here that makes up Okemo ski area, Plymouth ski area, which is a private one, and Killington ski areas. So headed out on tow. And we're going just to the north side of the castle, as I mentioned. Initially, I could see the results of the cold uh, winter air. Actually, this is a picture not of, from that day, but of me and my glider being towed behind the tow plane that was being used that same very day. So all the same. And the cold winter air, low density altitude, and the 260 horsepower Pawnee had my Varios and Averager, which is a 30-second Averager, all pegged, which in my glider, it's a bit older. They peg out at 10.55 uh, knots. A knot is one nautical mile up um, per hour, which equates to about 100 feet per minute, if you're so curious. And passing through about 3,000 feet AGL, we started to hit a little bit of rotor and some wind shear and turbulence. Below that, it was dead smooth calm, uh, just some terrific climb. But passing through about 3,000 AGL, you could start to feel the air move a little bit. Although not strong, I saw the average drop down to about eight and a half knots. And occasionally, even longer periods, we stayed in what was likely sink with the average down to 7.25 knots. Just above 5,000 feet. It smoothed out, but without an increase. And as we're still tracking north northwest, I asked the tow pilot to turn due west. And soon after, I saw an increase in the climb rate and felt comfortable letting off. I let off and immediately found the weak wave with about one to two knots of lift. So I started to track on the forecast wave street. And unlike most glider pilots, because I do both, and for the airplane pilots, I use four flight. And what I do is I drop, you know, little points where I end up finding the lift. And here's an example that you can see is as I hit lift here, started tracking slowly north in the wave and was dropping it there. So it's going climbing only about one to two knots and only had about a 12 to 14 knot ground speed going north due to the wind. But as I usually do, I was dropping those. And I even hit a longer stretch of, you know, basically zero sink. Wasn't losing altitude, but really wasn't gaining. 
as you can see there. And, but that made sense to me because I was just off of Route 100 north of Akima where there's a big gap in the mountains. And as a result, I don't think there was much wave action. And you'll be able to see that in the next picture. Yeah. I saw that in the pre-flight planning too. And as I got north of Plymouth, I picked up some lift staying closer to two knots as I climbed up to about 9,000 feet MSL, according to it. And here's a picture from that day. This is a chemo ski area here. This is probably before I hit that zero lift area. And you see how it flattens out. And then it, at the Plymouth ski area, the next ridge started up right over here on the side. Now, this is an interesting picture to me. <laughs> Uh, because you, it gives you an overview of how blue the sky was, how little rotor cloud development there was, you know, indicating the wave action. And also, what is interesting, which we'll see later, if you see where these power lines are near this large solar field, is right down here are the fields that I ended up landing in later on in the day. I actually ended up taking a picture of it. So as I continue to climb north, you know, for the glider pilot in me, there was something I started to see that attracted my attention. And it was right here, the rotor clouds. And based upon my track, I really felt as if I was in a secondary or third tertiary wave. I was tracking north up this area, but I really could tell that I was going to be a couple miles behind this band of rotor clouds that was developed off of the Killington Mountain ski area. And, you know, being a glider pilot, what was going through my mind is, if I can get on the forward side of that rotor, I bet you it's nice in terms of smooth and also lift. Knowing that it probably was gonna be pretty rough passing by these rotor clouds to maybe get into it. But if I was only getting one or two knots in a secondary wave, I figured I'd probably be getting three or four knots in the primary if I could get up there. So as I slowly was tracking north and looking at it, I made up in my mind, I said, you know, if I get to about 9,000, I think I'll give it a try. You know, that'll give me a few thousand feet loss of altitude to push forward uh, trying to get into that. And here's an example of what my track basically looked like. It was a late start on the track only because it was the middle of winter. My iPad was cold and I didn't have it tucked away and didn't have the heater, so I had to let it warm up. But I tracked north on the wave as you had seen earlier with dropping the points. And then I got up to here. I figured, okay, I'm up about 9,000 feet. This is probably a good place to push forward. And the reason why is I could see a couple of the rotor clouds um, associated with the Plymouth ski area, uh, which is right down in here. There's, or excuse me, right up in here. And then up here is Killington. And there was more rotor clouds up here and just one or two little puppies right there. So, okay, if I kind of go in between that gap and you can see this notch in the valley right here that this Route 100A goes through. I'm like, that's probably going to be an area that doesn't have much sink and also probably doesn't have much lift. But if I'm going to transition, that's a good place to do it. So that's what I figured I'd do. And when I got to about four to five miles east, I started pushing forward. Yeah. I went forward for about four miles at about 65 to 70 knots. My glide computer showing that I had a wonderful you know, 13 to 1 glide ratio over the ground. After close to 3,000 feet, I gave up right in this area, losing 3,000 feet, and retreated south towards the couple little rotor clouds uh, that were by the Plymouth ski area. And if I go back, this gives you a little example of it. There's some major ones, there's a small one. I think in this picture, the rotor cloud I retreated to was would have been back over here on the screen. As I got over there right near Plymouth, you can see on the track a little bit of movement here. 
with it. And there I hit really what was just a touch of rotor lift. I really was able to work it. You know, it was pretty rough. And I moved around a bit trying to push into the wind and still wasn't getting anything than moderate turbulence. So I finally said, okay, that's enough of this. I, I need to retreat and get back to lift uh, on it. And I started my retreat. You know, <laughs> my initial plan was to go right back to those points where I had had the wave lift. Um, that had been working earlier. And I was looking at my glide amoeba that you see in four flight and you see in many other things. You know, if you have an LX nav glass display in your glider, you have something very similar to this. This is an example of it. But I had a large finger on that that went out to the Claremont airport and it showed me wrapping around down to Springfield. You know, I still had multiple airports available within my glide amoeba, uh, showing that I could make it with a thousand foot reserve. So I just, okay, I, I got some safety here, but I need to go back and find some lift with it. You know, and I headed towards the direction of the home airports. I was now below about 6,000 feet and about 12 miles from Springfield, 16 to Claremont and 18 to Lebanon. Glide Amoeba was showing me that I had Springfield and Claremont made, but not Lebanon. But the ideal calculations at my reserve still would have put me with an extra 800 feet above my 1,000 feet. You know, so I'm, okay, plenty of room here. And I couldn't calculate it exactly in my head, but it started looking to me in my mind as I'm looking, at this is going to be closer than this is all telling me. And as I headed back, I kept getting beat up in the turbulence and sink, and the tailwind I had hoped for, no more so really in plan for, just wasn't materializing. I found myself at lower altitudes with only 10 knots of tailwind at best, and as I got lower, it turned into a direct crosswind, although light. And this probably had a big impact on my state of mind than it did my actual life, as the winds aloft or packed in fourth light, along with the ADSB weather in that I had. You know, I was like, okay, I got some safety here, but I started to feel that I wasn't getting all that comfortable. And if you're curious, this is how the flight basically went. If you take a look, this is the toe. You can see after I've got off toe climbing steadily up to about 9,000 feet that I had on my altimeter. I, what this tracker is taken from, I had not adjusted, so it's showing probably a little bit lower. This is me pushing forward. This is me trying to find some. And you can see, I basically came down out of the sky pretty darn quick. <laughs> and it was starting to worry me about the thing. You know, looking at my glide calculator after the flight, I looked down and I had about a 14 to one glide ratio, even with a little bit of tailwind. And this is in a glider that has a 38 to one glide ratio published. So that's always something to think about is just because the manual says you can do it, doesn't mean that you can. And many glider pilots know and understand that. But a lot of airplane pilots, you know, it's, oh, I can glide, you know, nine and a half to one in a Cessna 172. No, you can't. <laughs> only with a good tailwind. And only if you're flying at the appropriate speeds. You know, all the way down to 3,000 feet, it was just big, big sink. I mean, classically, if you're flying wave, you're kind of prepared for that, but it was catching me off guard. I was averaging about six knots that day. And I had reached a point where, okay, now I got to take advantage of any and all lift and even adjusted my course over spur lines and um, ridge lines, just hoping to find anything, you know. If you take a look at, um, oops, sorry, we'll take a look at it here in a second, but I'm starting to take a look at the higher terrain and I'm in that position of starting to accept a bad day with it. And if you take a look at my course line here, you'll see that I did, even though I had found the lift, I knew I was probably below it out of the wave and instead of retreating back still further, 
I started tracking down this ridge line here, just trying to find anything and anything. I had hit a small spot of lift about 1.3 knots for a second and made a turn into the wind, suspecting it was either, you know, convergence lift or some ridge. And then I got stuck with a big bump of about six knots. I now was about 90 degrees off course and stuck down in this valley and I lost final glide. I got real busy and I kind of realized to myself, you know, hey, it's getting their time to fess up because it's just what's out there is just not that nice over there. You know, it was starting to hit me that as I was sitting in this area here, up here, there we go, right up here, I was looking back and if you take a look, here's the Springfield Airport and you'll see this large ridge line between it. And I was looking at it and seeing how shallow I would be coming over the trees to wrap around that ridge to make it back to the airport and really was not feeling all that comfortable about it. So I was going along and in this area here, I hit that six knots and then realized I was in this valley and it's where I made a important decision it is I was right on the edge of my computer equipment telling me that I had best glide or had the ability to glide back to Springfield but it just looked really really flat and the terrain between here and there looked inhospitable and that's you know what I'm just not comfortable with this I'm better off being in a valley where I know there's some fields and in out than I am to try to push it with no outs if it goes bad. And then after a little bit being in that six knots of sync, my computer showed me that I had lost best glide. And I had decided in my mind just before that that was the time to fess up. So I, I called up on 233, which was the frequency, the few of us that were flying, just calling to see if anybody was still on, because I really didn't know if they were or not. You know, and I figured that was better than changing frequencies while, you know, trying to find a possible place to land and search for lift and everything with that. You know, it got to the point where the only bump that I felt after that was specifically um, as I was on upwind on it. Another glider, Bravo Uniform, answered back to my call, and I'm sure he could hear the stress in my voice. And in my mind, I was starting to think, I can't believe this. You know, <laughs> I'm going to land out. And I started to also think, okay, you got to focus a little bit here. I told him what was up and told him that I had lost final glide and would likely be landing out, but would work anything available, you know, and just to kind of be there for me. Um, you know, he started asking, well, do you got final glide? No, that's what I just said. And back and forth we went, but I really don't remember most of that conversation. I just remember being really busy trying to find any sliver of lift and also trying to do field assessments, you know, while trying to even figure out where I was from the low altitude because I was not super knowledgeable in the area. You know, I knew some of the uh, large fields we're just east of this solar complex in here, and that's where I kind of went off. As I got there, I started looking at the high tension lines, and oh boy, okay, I probably ought to give those a big berth, because I know, and I hate to say, I've, I've seen the results of what happens when somebody hits power lines and cables. You know, I also started looking around on the ground for a flag or two, because it's the middle of winter, uh, you know, you can't, there's no leaves on the trees really to speak of to be blowing around or water and I I knew from the couple flags that I did find that the wind on the surface was not an issue but I also did know that all the fields were snow covered and although the snow was pretty darn thin you know at the airport and where I live I was up a thousand feet higher you know, 30 miles further north. I truly didn't know the condition of the snow or how deep the snow was. <laughs> so I 
get in the position that okay, I got a, I got into this area, started choosing these fields with it, and how do I prepare for it? And if you look very closely, uh, I had taken it off, but you can see the blue remnants of the track that I ended up taking around and landed, and this ended up being the field here that I landed in, which of course I'm sure there's a lot of questions that will revolve around that, but <clears throat> my original plan was to land in the field closest to the road, but I saw markers uh, in the middle and it made me nervous about the proximity of a fence and power lines. <clears throat> I knew that going down the middle, especially right through this narrow gut here, I probably would end up taking out markers that were there for the snowmobile trail and could be going through that narrow gut and could end up in some damage. This narrow gut made me nervous because I just couldn't see about maybe there was a fence that cut through this area here. And that's what made me nervous. So I said, instead of close to the road, maybe I'll move over into this area. But I could see a few dark patches through the snow, which told me, you know, that things were angled there. Maybe it was some large rocks or stumps or bushes or something. But that kind of told me, yeah, maybe it's not as best as it could be. So at that point, I ended up changing and I looked at this field, which looked pretty small. I could see the snowmobile trail markers right close to the edge. And then I also could tell that this face right here was upsloping. And I knew, okay, if I'm touched down here and go into the upsloping face, it, you know, it'll make for a very short landing. And that's kind of what I was looking for. Something smooth, safe, <laughs> and short. So on the downwind next to the field, I could see that the markers were closer to the stream, as I mentioned, and I figured if I took that diagonally, I was concerned about the power lines, so I turned my base directly over them, not going beyond them, uh, just to assure myself that I knew where they were and that I didn't end up getting stuck on them at all. As I made the turn on the final, right in this area, which we'll see in a moment, a very large tree. So I ended up doing a little bit of S turning and came down in the field in kind of a uh, curving approach like this. Uh, ended up touching down, you know, as S turns on final and near full dive breaks and watching for the stakes. I put it down where I planned and also at the minimum speed, full dive breaks on landing and all was going well, even with the nose sliding on the snow and the tail up in the air with full lap elevator. But it was the last 30 feet that, you know, concerned me. It is at that point, the, no, the noise and the drag just got downright awful. I decelerated at an even greater rate, and I thought I broke off something, like the landing gear doors or my wheel. I truly did. I got out of the glider expecting to see my main wheel back by my tail wheel. I, I really did think I had broken the glider at that point. But, you know... Luck has some to do with it. The snow was pretty hard packed because uh, it had melted and refrozen some. And that awful noise that I had heard was actually once enough weight became supported by the wheel that it broke through the upper crust of the snow. And that's what the very loud crunching noise was. It actually no damage to the glider at all in relation to it. And the place I had chosen, I had chosen because this was a good marker. Growing up in New England, I saw this Tucker Snowcat, these few buildings, and then as I got lower, the markers, and could see the various uh, snowmobile trails. I knew, compared to what it may be out in a field outside of it, that there was a high likelihood that the snow in that area was compacted down. And whether it be from the snow groomer, or just from snowmobiles as a whole, which probably would make for a better landing area. After I landed, I figured I'd walk up the trail to the intersection of the hut, which were about 100 feet away, to find out exactly where I was, because I didn't know. And little did I know, but I pretty much had found the best place you could find in Vermont to land out in the middle of the winter, is they actually have a cheeseburger hut, which I was bummed it was closed because there wasn't enough snow out there, but I had, Picnic tables, giant porta potty, a big 
map sign saying you are here <laughs> and all of that it, it really was it was a sunny winter day in vermont and about 30 degrees so then i okay let me get to work here i called my son left a message and also tried to send him a text on my location via maps but in a classic sense a generational issue challenged us is i'm an apple products guy he's a droid based person and in areas of weak signal they don't talk well to each other especially beyond just text messaging so even though i was texting him i was getting messages that you know message did not go through and stuff like that then it hit me my son had been up flying with somebody else in another glider earlier and i know the other pilot has apple cell phone and you know iphone so i text him get an answer right away send him location bingo right to him he knew what was going on right away and okay we're on our way you know and the glider was a little bit hard to see it was white in a snow-covered field and i also figured that keeping a low profile would probably work best you know work-wise i have been on the other end of this when somebody from the public calls and says you know i think the sky is falling because the glider just came out of it and no that's not the case uh but i figured okay here i am a government employee in the middle of a government shutdown <laughs> Maybe I ought to keep a low profile. And a friend of mine did joke, he's like, you know, after the fact, I just see the headlines now. Government FAA inspector <laughs> makes emergency landing in field. You know, I just figured it was best not to attract any attention. But for any of you that have landed at some place other than an airport, whether it be in a glider or in an airplane, you know, it's probably going to attract at least a little bit of attention. In my case, it was all positive uh, and great. You know, I was sitting there at the picnic tables, and a person that happens to know the fields and works on them in the summertime was driving by. He literally looked me in the eye, saw me at the picnic table, but paid no attention to me at all. Just drove right by, and I could see him going down. But a couple hundred yards down the road, all of a sudden, I see the brake lights go on. I'm like, huh, I wonder what's up. Well, he was looking back, looking over in the fields and happened to see the glider out there and put two and two together. So he came back and just checked on me and he said, oh yeah, you know, this is owned by so-and-so, her house is down the road there, blah, 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 blah. You know, hey, where you landed is a perfect spot to it. You know, you gotta go across that bridge, but that bridge is made for logging trucks. You know, <laughs> it'll take a logging skitter, you know, with a full load and stuff. No problem driving right out to it and everything would be great no weight issues at all you know and he gave me the contact information for the owners and hey have a good day a little bit later one of the property owners did stop by uh, i think actually was probably called by the first person uh, but just checking in on me all the same you know oh yeah hey drive right up to the glider no problem send us some pictures you know we never had a glider land in one of those fields we get snowmobiles out there all winter long but never a glider and then at the same time the president of the local snowmobile club showed up to take pictures the first guy knew him and had called him and it was now big doings in the little town you know it's been a really rough season for them and they um had not had much going on really could not end up keeping any snowmobiles out on the trails or whatever but you know he came by took some pictures of the glider and all that and asked me hey can you send me something you know that i can put in our newsletter it'll be make everybody happy that you know things are going on and things are happening and you know i grew up around ski areas and it was the orange tucker snowcat that first caught my attention so we talked about that for a little while and then you know kind of the recovery as most of you that have landed out have dealt with you know is it takes a little bit of time but as we were talking my recovery party arrived with my son driving you know a trailer for the first time on tow and a little back and forth and as you can see here we we're able to bring the trailer right up to the glider which was great uh, you know 
I'm up here in northern New England, so yes, I have a Subaru. You know, put studded snow tires on it in the winter for the type of weather that we deal with. You know, is no problem driving across a snow-covered field down frozen logging roads and all that. We disassembled, packed things away, and you know, we end up having a few jokes, of course, about how much this was going to cost me <laughs> in steak dinners. I think my son has uh, recouped on that a few times over now <laughs> with it. Uh, you know, but we put it away and we're able to bring it right back to the hangar where we started at the end of the day, before even the sunset, you know, on one of the shortest days of the year, is able to tuck it right back away with all the others. But as we're heading back, really the first big lesson associated with this came home. You know, it's nice to have the radio communications, but, you know, the classic game of telephone is I talked to another glider who was up in the air who then transferred, was also talking to the tow pilot who was trying to talk to people on the ground and also trying to write things down while he was flying. And one of the people that came to help me recover was the tow pilot. And we got talking and he said, you know, with the coordinates and stuff that you gave me, I don't think we would have ever found you. You know, having that text map <laughs> over the iPhone really made all the difference. And, you know, later on in the day, my son shared a snap picture of the coordinates that they wrote down. And I found the error. Where I had landed out was at 43.43 degrees north. 72.65 degrees west. Can you hear me, John? Yeah, I've got you five by five, Steve. I can hear you fine. Okay. I'm just curious because um, my phone is, or the thing, I just noticed, I apologize, folks. Noticing that uh, I got a message about audio control and all of that, and it's not showing as um, being live. That's why I wanted to double check. <laughs> yeah, no, and, and we're getting a lot of feedback from the field, too, everybody's saying they can hear you. We did have, okay. back back about 10, 15 minutes ago, we had a couple that sent in and said that they had audio issues, but um, during that period, I had never had an audio issue, so I suggested they switch to the telephone, but... Other than that, everybody says you sound really great. We're getting a lot of feedback okay. now. Everybody said you, you says you sound great. Okay, terrific. Thank you. Sorry about that, folks. Just it caught my attention, and I'm like, it's been quiet. <laughs> I haven't heard anything, and then I I noticed that on my control board. But as I was saying, my position was 43.43 degrees north and 72.65 degrees west. But at the end of the communication chain, what was written down was 43.3 north with 72.65 degrees west. And this is the difference. If you take a look at this, here's the Springfield Airport where we all started flying out of. This is where I ended up landing out. And based upon the coordinates that were written down, this is where they would have gone to retrieve me. <laughs> you know, which by road was 17 and a half miles away. And that was kind of the first thing, like, boy, you probably need a, more than one way to communicate at the end if something like this happens where you are. You know, and that really is what started getting me thinking about the lessons to be learned with this because we're all human and we're all fallible at some level. And many of us have circumstances where we think we're doing everything as best as we possibly can you know, doing it as safely as we possibly can, but we're just somehow, some way missing the big picture, you know, just like you see here in this picture. And that's what got me thinking about this event was, what is it that I was not paying attention to enough? And what is it that I should pay more attention to? So the first thing, and this is primarily for the glider pilots, but is to really have a deeper observation on tow and how important that is. Is I've always paid attention to watching 
where there are changes in the lift, the turbulence, et cetera, when I'm on trail, and using it to decide when to get off. You know, but to an extent, that's something that I really think about maybe have the mind trap of what I would call the thermal season, where you really can start to feel all of that. And on tow, that's what I'm looking for. But in regards to that, on the other end of the spectrum, if you don't feel anything, you really need to give that some strong consideration too, you know, is if you're not getting any bumps, you're having a smooth toe, like I said, up to 3,000 feet before, or, you know, even 6,000 feet, don't expect or think there's any way you're going to find some lift or changes in the air. <laughs> if you didn't see it going up, you're probably not going to see it coming down. And I think that was one of the things that I learned is from the toe, I should have known that it really was only above 5,000 feet that there was any type of movement in the air that day. And that from about 6,000 feet and below, you know, 5,000 feet AGL, I really had to make sure that I was going to be in a position that I was on final glide back to the airport. You know, there's no reason to think that I might find something below that altitude. And as a result, if I had thought that to begin with, I probably would have chosen an altitude higher than 9,000 feet, much higher, before I made that attempt to go find that primary wave. But I was thinking in kind of a summer mindset and thinking, well, you know, there's opportunities for lift down lower too, and just not the case. Pre-flight planning, this always has an impact on you, no matter what type of aircraft you're flying or where you're flying. But, you know, realize there are differences in your comfort level between your home airport and another airport. You know, I am a lucky guy. I get to fly gliders at many different airports and around the country. And even though I'm familiar with the Springfield Vermont Airport, I'm not completely comfortable with it. You know, it's not way up there on my comfort level. I, I know of it. I've flown in and out of there a lot in airplanes, but I haven't necessarily flown in and out of there a lot in gliders. And after the fact, I kind of wish I had looked at this a bit more and thought more about the available airports around there. You know, when I sat down and looked after the fact, all I really had for regular airports was Rutland, which would have been going over 4,000 foot tall mountains and ridges to get to, going into the wind, so not a very likely candidate. Lebanon, which after the fact I discovered really was further than I thought from the area that I was flying in. And then Springfield, which is back over to the east but also had that Hawks Mountain Ridge kind of in the way uh, from where I was. And even though there are a lot of private airports in that area, most of them are closed down and at best probably looked like the field that I ended up landing in because they pretty much were all snow covered and many of them being used for things like snowmobiling and cross country skiing. And, you know, in my pre-flight planning, I had been checking the weather. Uh, ahead of time been looking at the soaring forecasts and stuff and as i do even in the summer I, I look for different types of lift you know the ridge the thermal the convergence and i didn't see any forecasts for really anything but the wave and i knew it you know it it's funny but you just look oh yeah not much of that not much of that oh there's wave lift awesome and you focus in on it and i really closed my mind off to what happened if I was not in the wave lift. And it really hit me when I was about halfway back, you know, to Springfield on that flight. And like, this is kind of stupid, Steve, to be thinking that you might find some lift below 6,000 feet out here, you know? And I just wasn't finding it, and it was starting to hit home that maybe <laughs> you should have paid attention a little bit more to your pre flight planning. And it, it's also good to know is how good is that airport? This is kind of what I would call my home airport in the past, uh, Moulton Borough, New Hampshire. 
And it's always good to know what things might be lurking out there for the unsuspecting pilot, you know, whether it be the glider pilot or the airplane pilot with it. Great little airport, you know, set away in New Hampshire near the lakes and mountain, you know, would encourage anybody to use it if they can. Uh, but it's also interesting is I've flown in and out of there and I know the airport really well. And I've talked to some glider pilots about it. You know, like, oh yeah, I'd use Bolton Borough as, you know, an outlanding or a safety field. And, you know, these are people flying with 18 meter wings, 50, uh, you know, 60 foot wide wingspans in relation. I'm like, you would? I, I happen to know that runway, although it says 50, is only 47 feet wide. And then the lights are put on three foot, three to four foot tall galvanized posts that we got at the local hardware store so that they'd stick up above the snow in the wintertime. Is if you go in there in an 18 meter wing, you're definitely going to take out runway lights, you know, metal poles that are stuck in the ground. And they're like, oh, I'll just land off in the side in the grass. In many airports, that is doable, but not all. You know, this particular airport, only because you know it, is if you're off the runway, you would think, oh, this is a nice grass area. It, most of the year, it's swamp. And then when it is dry, it's got like foot deep trenches from tractor wheels in it. It just really doesn't work out well. And for the glider pilots and even the types that might want to land in the grass at Jason and the Runway, we're running into that issue more and more in the airports out there. I also thought a lot about the wind. And although you see it in the forecast and learn from experience, you know, it's um, as a pilot, you always seem to have that innate ability to perceive that the tailwind is always going to equal the headwind, but that's not true. That's something that really hit home on this particular flight. You know, when I released up 6,000 feet, you know, there was a 40 to 50 knot wind from the west northwest, but down at three or 4,000 feet, it had gone down to only about 20 knots or a little bit less, and it was calm down below about 2,000 and down on the surface. You know, I climbed up and in my mind, I thought, okay, if I have to retreat and turn back, I'm going to have that tailwind. And I'm fighting the headwind that whole flight thinking, okay, if I turn back and retreat, I got that terrific tailwind. I didn't. When I turned back to retreat, I was at a lower altitude. I had much less of a tailwind than I ever expected to find. And actually, in this particular case, as I got down even lower, like 2,000 feet AGL, I found that it was a direct crosswind on the course that I was on, and it wasn't helping me at all. Also thinking about, you know, if you fly in the mountains, you see this. These two pictures are pictures I've taken of uh, the Mount Washington Cog Railway when I've been up flying, but of the coal-powered one that blows out a lot of smoke. And you can see the wind coming across on the spur and how it breaks it up. But on this next one, it's associated with the wave as it's coming down over the edge of the mountain. You can just see the smoke literally plummet off of the side and down here into the valley. You can see little wisps of it still down in the corner where it literally was just dropping 2,000 feet in less than a minute. And, you know, you can have circumstances associated with wave flying and mountain flying where that's the case. You really need to be well aware and think about where that sink is going to be happening. And I knew when I pushed forward that I had, I would at least fly through some sink, but I never really thought about it in terms of what happens if I end up staying in the sink too long. And I think that was something that trapped me. Now, on the positive side, you know, luckily in the few weeks before the holidays and everything, I had been doing some what I would call professional development. But I like to read, I like to keep up on stuff. So I had done a little bit, you know, reading, had uh, actually watched a 
three hour long video from a mid Atlantic area club about why wave and bridge flying. You know, and what it did is it reaffirmed a lot of things that I already knew or was aware of, but it helped me kind of get in the mindset. I also had just finished reading uh, some of, for a second time, Bob Wander's series on cross country flights. And thankfully, by the uh, off airport landings by Ty Gersten, I literally had just read the weekend before. So it all helps. You know, in retrospect, there are a few little things that I probably should have adjusted for the type of operation I was doing. But I think that was something that helped put me in the right mindset. It is important, you know, that you do have something to help you track where you are. You know, and a big, big learning thing for me from this, which is something myself and many other glider pilots have dealt with, is a real satellite-based track. You know, I hate to admit it, but I bought my glider and really hadn't been doing much cross-country flying before. And I looked at it as one of those expensive items that is a necessity. But human nature, I had not really come to grips with departing with the cash is hard. You know, those aviation monetary units. So I had not spent the money on one yet. Although I did plan on it, I just had not pulled the trigger yet. And what I had been using was a um, cell phone based tracker that is available out there. Uh, but I also had found that it worked okay, but it was really not the best thing to be using with it. And in fact, um, I had had some discussions even prior to this with one or two pilots that do a lot of cross-country flying. And, you know, even I look at the environment and the impact that it has on it. When I look back at this, a couple of us had kind of started talking about it in our club, but the club I belonged to over the years had morphed into more of a training club. We really only had one or two people with glass ships at the club and everybody really was staying right on a local ridge, you know, not going so far or doing a whole lot in terms of going away from the airport. So, you know, nobody in the club really saw or had a need to use one. But the club was in the process of changing. More and more higher performance gliders and pilots that were stretching their legs were getting involved more. And we just had kind of lost, you know, that tribal knowledge, that expertise to emphasize how important it is to have some type of device that will help others find you. You know, you, you lose that experience. And that's, you know, professional development can help with that, but it's not going to solve it all. And, you know, a personal locator beacon is good, but one thing to always think about is that requires you to be conscious and able to activate it. You know, a satellite tracker is better in relation to it. And, you know, I was being naive about it, I guess is the way to describe it, is I planned to get one, but human nature, I didn't depart with the money. And I had even bought a brand new parachute and had a special pocket made, you know, that it was sewn for the harness on it, specifically to hold the satellite tracker but just didn't have it in there. And I can't emphasize enough for, if you're in an aircraft with an ELT, like the motor or um, airplanes out there, please, please, please get a 406 ELT uh, installed in your airplane. It is They are so much better. The 121.5 is not monitored at all. I've dealt with a few circumstances personally where, you know, the impact. I know we had an accident here that I ended up being the first one to hear the ELT. And the only way we heard it was because I was doing a route inspection on a 121 air carrier and we're departing out of Boston Logan. And I'm like, this is really weird to hear an ELT in this location, you know, guys reported in and it still was over 45 minutes for him to find the aircraft even though it was right beside the airport and 
around the country, we've had multiple ones. You know, the 406 ELT will tell you where the aircraft is if it's activated. You know, a 121.5 tells you what state it's in. That's about all that it does. And nobody's monitoring the 121.5s anymore, other than pretty much your air carriers, other pilots. With everything we do, practice, practice, practice. You know, I can't emphasize being a proficient pilot helps you do things better. It helps, you know, exemplify correct decisions. And one of the things I've always been a strong, strong advocate for is for glider pilots and all pilots flying at different airports and different fields. You know, a glider pilot certificate is about the only certificate or rating you can do where you do all of your landings at a single home airport. You know, you really have to take advantage of trying a glider ride somewhere else. You know, you go on vacation, or you're in Florida, Arizona, California, Hawaii, wherever it may be, take the opportunity to go for a ride somewhere else. It's gonna help you show you differences in weather, differences in operating techniques, you know, all of those things that you can use to help make you a better pilot. You know, and another thing is if your club specifically does an encampment anywhere, participate, you know. Taking the opportunity as a student or as a club member to go fly at a different airport is really gonna help you out in the long run. It's gonna make you a much, much better pilot. You know, and, and this is an add-on here at the end, but this summer I ended up having the opportunity where I was driving by that same area where I had landed out, so I figured I'd do the couple mile diversion and go see, and this is the actual field where I ended up but now in the summertime, and as I take a look at those fields in the summertime, it probably would change my decision. You can see these hay bales out there, you know, some of the tractors out in the middle of the field, probably some other equipment, if I recall, is looking at this on the ground in the summertime, by far, I really would take the field that was closest to the road versus the one that was further away from the road that I had chosen in the winter time. Now granted, it's all in the rush, the heat of the moment on the decisions that you make, but it was very interesting to have kind of this major event and to reflect back on it, then six months later or eight months later, as this case was, to walk, to be able to walk the same area and think about it and and look at what you would do differently from one season to another. And I think that's important. Now, in relation to it, one of the things I want to emphasize is what we call land and live. And doing a little bit of research after this, when we talk about precautionary landings, specifically for light aircraft, such as this, believe it or not, is a student pilot that ended up deciding to make a precautionary landing at a field and everything worked out well for that individual you know very low energy aircraft which is great but AOPA had taken a look at some of the fatality rates for a precautionary landing where the aircraft was operating appropriately but due to weather or some other circumstances the pilots had decided to make a precautionary landing at an airport or off airport, but with power still available, the fatality rate was less than 0.06%. If they continued on into the weather enough or dealt with an engine out where they were forced to land, the fatality rate was about 10%. If they had to ditch the aircraft in water, the fatality rate was about 20%. And if they lost control of the aircraft in flight um, because of weather or some other reason, it was close to 50% fatality rate. Now, for the airplane pilots, you know, yeah, you might end up making a precautionary landing, but you'd be surprised. I think your survival rate 
will end up being much, much better. The damage rate to the aircraft will end up being much, much less. It's something for us to really start thinking about, especially in the typical general aviation, um, low energy type aircraft. You know, it's significant changes with the mass. You know, the Piper Cub, of course, does a lot better than an Airbus 320 with it. And so much so, the Helicopter Association International started a program a little over a year ago that they call the Land and Live to Stay Alive, where, you know what, especially in helicopters where you have the ability to almost land vertically, if not, is if you're facing conditions where the weather is bad or something is not right, it's probably so much better for you just to land and wait it out, you know, so much better. And, you know, I used to work, and I, I do a program around this too. I used to work for a large aviation supply company where we kind of had some rules to live by. And this was rule number five that we had of flying the citation where in case of fire, get it on the ground and not necessarily at an airport. And years later, we had an event here in the United States that I think really helped emphasize that to us. Is, you know, if you've ever seen the movie, know the story, The Miracle on the Hudson, so forth and so on. There were two things from that that I really, really liked. One was in the movie, they portrayed it probably dramatized it, but taking the opportunity to stop and think about what is going on to assess what's going on. But more so, like I just said with that rule number five, not necessarily at an airport, is recognizing that in some circumstances, making, you know, an off airport landing, even in a large aircraft, can have a very, very positive outcome. And we had that with a miracle on the Hudson. And since then, we've even had near the equivalent in a cornfield in Russia. And you always want to be thinking about what the total energy of the aircraft is. That's the important part. You know, your total energy is equal to your potential energy plus your kinetic energy. Mass has a significant part to play in both of these. Kinetic energy, velocity, has probably the most prominent factor and for potential energy height probably has the most important factor what it basically comes down to is the least amount of damage or the best outcome on any time you come close to touching the ground whether it's planned or not is going to be at minimum velocity and control and also at minimum height and the lower the mass, the better. And this is for, give you a little bit of an idea of what it's like, but what is the velocity at impact with the surface from a height, a fall of a height? So if we take a look at 10 meters, um, you know, which is about 30 feet, you're taking a look at the equivalent of probably hitting the ground at about 34, 35 miles um, per hour. This is in kilometers per hour, this is in meters. Here's another example though. If you talk about a height of 50 meters, if you were to kind of like drop out of the sky, if we talk about loss of control, that's the equivalent of impact at about 110 um, kilometers, so about 70 miles per hour. You know, think about it this way. What would happen if you walked out into the middle of a freeway with cars doing 70 miles per hour? That's kind of what it's like if you end up having a fall or lose control of an aircraft from that altitude. So it is very, very important that you fly the aircraft all the way to touchdown. So as we depart here tonight, I hope this story is put forward a few things for you to think about. Uh, I hope you've learned from my experience. I know that I have. But the key points to this is pay attention to the environment, what's going on around you. You know, in your pre-flight preparation, adjust for the seasons, adjust for the conditions. Don't fall into 
a trap or a groove of looking at things is I was in the trap of looking at things from soaring in the summer and did not pay attention really to what I was really should have been for winter time flying. Being familiar with the air and the wind, lift in the sink and thinking about it, you know, applicable for all of us as pilots, but very, very important for the glider pilots. For all of us, professional development and having appropriate trackers and ELT. And, you know, take a look, take an opportunity to look at the Helicopter Association uh, International, their land and live uh, program. And think about it a little bit in relation to airplanes. I think it is something that we could help break fewer bodies if we had more people thinking in that way. And last but not least is practice, practice, practice. Why? Because, you know, I want you to land and live. And a precautionary landing should not be spooky for any of us uh, in relation to it. So I do want to thank you. You know, one of the things I always ask, and I ask this of all my safety reps and all the people that work with, but if we all work on promoting, educating, and improving in general aviation, we'll make it all the better for all of us out there. So do please try to do that and keep proficiency and peace of mind. Just think about a regular annual proficiency program for yourself. Fly regularly with your CFI practice, and if you don't have it available uh, through your club or organization, you know, take a look at our Wings Pilot Proficiency Program. It's available. Uh, a quick little cheat sheet on it is available in the handouts for it tonight. If you need to contact me, here's my contact information. I do appreciate you joining us tonight. Uh, we'll take some time now, you know, to answer some of the questions that people may have, but you don't have to stay on at this point in time. In the next couple days, I will end up uploading the credit on FAAsafety.gov. Uh, John and I here, we normally do a webinar on the last Tuesday of every month. We move this one ahead to Monday night because of New Year's Eve, but we do want to thank you. We got a couple others uh, coming up here in the near future, John. All right, we got uh, in your area, the Alton Bay Ice Runway webinar coming up soon. Yeah, we do, Steve. That's in uh, uh, 10 days uh, or so. It's a week from this coming Saturday. So what's that? That's the 4th, the 10th, the, the 11th, I think it is. Yeah. So join us for that. We'll be doing one. I don't think uh, it was on our agenda to discuss earlier today, but we didn't get to it. Uh, we're planning, we'll have one at the end of January on the last Tuesday of the month there. So uh, do take the opportunity and time. Uh, look for it out there and want to thank you very, very much for joining us tonight. Thanks for being with us, folks. And we have lots of questions. So if you want to stick around and hear the do answers, we? you're okay. welcome to do so. <laughs> yeah. We do. We do. <laughs> I, figured, I figured we would. I figured we would. Uh, we this, had like, this is one where <laughs> yeah, we had like 400 people on. There are a lot of questions that came in. Um, and a lot of them are specific, Steve, that you're going to kind of have to um, answer because they're kind of specific to your experience and to what happened. Oh, okay. Yeah. I will do my best. I will do my best. Uh, let's see. Um, here's, here's one. Here's one that was actually interesting. It started, he's left.